Hello, and welcome to this short video from the AACPS Office of Instructional Technology on digital choice boards and learning menus. So what, so what are choice boards and learning menus? Well, it's a form of differentiated learning that is going to allow students to choose how they want to practice and show their learning on any kind of content or topic that they um, need to learn about. We really like uh, choice boards because they are student-centered. It actually puts uh, the students in charge of their own learning. They're extremely flexible. There are a lot of different formats that choice boards um, can take. We're going to take a look at several of those here in uh, this podcast. Um, they work well for any age group. Even our younger students can use these, especially if they're very uh, icon or picture heavy. Um, and they can also be very really easily differentiated, whether it's a differentiated with one board for the whole class, or you simply modify uh, and have maybe multiple boards based on the levels of students in your class. So when can you use choice boards with your students? Well, this again goes back to that idea of flexibility. Choice boards really work anytime that you want them to be. Um, they work great in, of course, small group rotations because uh, students can do these independently. It works really well if you utilize a flipped classroom uh, type scenario with your students. Uh, again, they can work with students being in school or also if they're doing something at home. Uh, it's really up to you. You can really fit uh, choice boards into really any scenario that you want. So choice boards have been around for quite a while. This is not a new idea or a new concept, but why would we want to make them digital for our students? Well, it really comes down to three key points. One, when you have a digital choice board, you can really incorporate multimedia into them, whether it's from the idea of the students consuming the information through a video or a podcast, um, or even just those digital images, but they can also create multimedia in order to show their understanding of that concept. So they are no longer just consumers of the information, they can really be the creators of that information as well. Uh, accessibility tools. This is, of course, a big thing for many of our students. Um, when we have a choice board that is digital, that's really going to give students access to things like voice typing or speech to text. Um, again, the screen readers that are going to be out there, visual dictionaries, all of those types of tools that some of our students need to be successful. So again, just another layer that we can do with that digital version of a choice board. And finally, it's really easy for our students to submit uh, their work that they have done when we're doing something digitally. Um, they can put it all into a slide deck. They can uh, submit everything through the LMS. It's really up to you, but everything is in one little neat package for the teacher rather than the teacher trying to have to go and find and keep track of maybe you know five different sheets of paper all in a folder. So it's easy collection for the teachers. It's also easy for the students. It's a little less likely that they are going to lose something something when it's going to be done dig digitally. So when you think about designing your choice boards, um, again, everything's always going to come back to the pedagogy. Uh, we always do that before we would think about any of the tools that we're going to use in our choice board. So of course, it all needs to be around what is the learning objective? What do you want your students to uh, learn? What do you want them to be able to do by the time that they complete the activities on the choice board? What skills do you want them to develop? That's going to help you decide what types of activities that you're going to put on that choice board. Are they working on their communication skills? Are they working on their research skills? Do you want them to be using primary documents? All of those kinds of things will help uh, you decide what to put on that choice board. Again, they can be very easily differentiated. So again, if you have students that are really creative and love uh, doing plays and acting out, you might want to have a task that would appeal to that set, whereas you might then also want to include one that's going to appeal to your students who are more visual learners and who like to create posters and, and concept maps and things like that. And of course, again, all that also stems from what are the interests your students? Uh, are they interested in um, a particular program, even on the computer or a particular uh, concept? So again, all of those kinds of things are going to come down uh, to help you think about what is going to go onto your choice board. So once you've kind of gone through those steps and have figured out what you want the goals or objectives to be of your choice boards, then you can start moving into what specifically the students are going to complete. And when we think about this, we have a lot of applications, digital applications that our students have access to. Of course, for the gathering of information, we have things like our online databases and we're going to have videos that we can play. But we want students to also be the creator of content. We don't just want them to be consumers. So when you're thinking about 
about what your students can use to complete tasks, you might want to keep these six applications in mind. And this is just six. There are, of course, plenty of others that we can take a look at as well. Uh, one is going to be Wixi. This is something we have available here in AACPS. It's K through 12. Um, this program allows us to um, record and draw. They can complete a variety of templates. It's really a fantastic um, publishing and creativity platform, particularly for our elementary and middle school uh, students. We Video is our video uh, editor that we have access to. Uh, in fact, that's what I'm using to create this vodcast. Um, this is going to allow them to create not just videos, but also podcasts. So students could do something with just some audio in there. And of course, also GIFs. So even if they were doing uh, maybe a, a slide presentation, uh, they could actually create GIFs in We Video to embed within that slide deck uh, to show uh, what it is that they've learned or a process. Google Drawings is a fantastic way for doing concept maps, memes, uh, anything that's going to be sort of a one page. Drawings is a great tool for our students to use. Google Earth. Uh, Google Earth, everyone knows Google Earth from the concept of you know flying in and, and seeing your house from above. Uh, but Google Earth also allows students to create their own projects and their own uh, tours, if you will, about places around the world. So if they are learning anything um, that has to do um, with history or even science, even tracking a character in a story uh, throughout locations, they can actually use Google Earth and create that project to show those relationships uh, between the concept and places. Padlet um, has been around for a while. This is just a digital um, digital platform here, a digital post-it note board, if you will, where students can post text and images, audio or videos in response to a question. So this works well if you have a single discussion question if you want students to respond to. You can, of course, also do this as a discussion question in Google Classroom or in Brightspace, which is our uh, LMS that will be coming out. We also have Google Sites. Um, have students develop an entire website based on the ideas that they, they uh, talked about. So uh, this is great for, you know, again, a whole website, but you could also use it and approach it from a blog perspective where students can post uh, writing pieces that they want others outside to read. These are just a couple of examples and ideas that you can use. Uh, there are, of course, you know, the sky is the limit, and we have so many opportunities for our students to complete things digitally. So while there are plenty of digital opportunities for our students to express uh, their learning, don't forget not everything has to be digital. You can incorporate offline activities into your choice boards. In fact, the best choice board is going to give students that option uh, between offline and online activities. Uh, these are again just some examples. You could have students draw that picture concept map. In fact, if you want them to do a concept map, you could give them the option of doing it digitally or on paper and pencil, whatever they're going to be most comfortable with. Uh, nothing you know, replaces picking up an article or a book and actually reading that. Uh, you, they could write that poem, riddle, they could write their summary. Again, if they're more comfortable doing that handwritten, they can certainly do that. Something like flashcards uh, is, might be something that they want to do uh, in that offline manner. You know, again, you know, that idea of writing it is going to reinforce what they've learned. Have them interview a person. You know, that's not something that can be done very easily digitally. Getting, again, that primary source uh, out there for them to, to learn from. Sketch notes are really big, allowing them to kind of, again, make that connection between drawing and writing and picking out the main ideas. Uh, comic strips, um, building with recycled materials, have them act out the concept. All of those things can be done offline. And they can be still done offline, but they can submit those digitally by snapping a picture of what they've done and, again, pushing that out to the teacher either through the slide deck or through the LMS. So now that I've hopefully given you some ideas of the types of things you include on your choice boards, let's take a look at some ways you can actually format those ideas and get them out to your students. So the first um, format we're going to take a look at is the simplest, and this is the tic-tac-toe method, and it's exactly what it sound like, sounds like. Students are going to need to complete three activities on the choice board that will give them three in a row. And of course, that can be horizontal, vertical, or diagonally. In this example, which is from Shake Up Learning, and this particular template is from there as well, in Casey Bell, uh, the center square you'll see is white and it has a star on it. And this is the square that all students have to complete. So this is where you would say, okay, this is where your research is going to be. This is maybe the article they're going to read, the video that they're going to watch. So everyone would do that center square, and then they would have to pick two other activities to complete that three in a row. 
you'll see it's actually color coded and that's more for you um, as you are building the choice board where everything in blue might be a similar style activity. Maybe that is going to be the communication piece where everything in yellow might be some additional research that they have to go and look at. Completely up to you how you would want to approach that idea. Um, but again, you could even make it where the center square isn't required. Uh, you would just have to be a little bit more careful to make sure that your students are getting everything that you want out of that method. The second option we're going to take a look at is the column method. This is very similar to tic-tac-toe, except that you're going to have your students complete an activity from every column on the chart. Uh, in this particular example, I have one that is a read column, so everyone's going to read something. They're going to have everything that they're going to watch, and then they have a column where everyone is going to choose something that they are going to create. You'll see if you look carefully, I have included both online and offline options for students in this method. Now, this case, again, I have that read, watch, and create, but you could take a look at this and use the three E's or the five E's if you wanted. So your column headings might be engage, explore, and explain. Completely up to you. This really gives you some good flexibility. Again, you'll notice uh, color coding is in effect here just to kind of help your students move across those columns. That's not necessary, but it really is a nice uh, feature to include when you're designing your choice boards. The third and final uh, format that we're going to take a look at in this particular vodcast today is the choose your own adventure idea. And in this one, you're really going to use slides for this because that's going to allow you to hyperlink to different slides where the students would be able to insert their work, kind of all, again, completing that all in one package, if you will. And so we're going to take a look at this. This template was created by Catlin Tucker, and you can see she's got it titled here with your Choose Your Own Adventure. You can get this template from her website, and you'll see here on the second slide, she has broken this out into what do the students want to learn, how they want to learn it. Are they going to be doing reading, listening, uh, interviews, watching? She actually gives them six options. You'll see that they are supposed to pick two. Once she goes through that, how do you want to learn? She's going to, she gives them the option on what to process and some great think about stems there that you can use. So again, they can write, they can draw, and they can discuss. And of course, any of those options could be done uh, digitally or of course, offline. She then goes into how are they going to practice? So they can do a flip grid video, which would be ideal for our high schoolers that we have out there. Are they going to write that summary, kind of pulling everything together, or are they going to create flashcards for themselves? And that's going to be that review uh, piece. And then the fourth component of this particular um, format that we're looking at is how are they going to share their learning? So again, that major project at the end, and they have here actually a dozen different options that they can choose from. Again, some can be done um, offline, some are, can be done digitally, it's really up to the students. Some can even be done both or in a combination. And then at the end of this particular slide deck, she's giving them a place where they can insert the evidence of that learning. So anything that they did digitally would get put here. Um, anything they did offline, they could take a picture and insert either on the slide or on additional slides. So again, another just really great way that you can take a look at um, how you can get out these options. And this one was very open-ended, but you could certainly put in your own more specific choices if you wished. So once students complete their choice boards and those activities, there has to be a way for you to see and assess what it is that they have done. Uh, so there's a couple of different ways that you can collect student work. One is going to be through an assignment in Brightspace or an assignment in Google Classroom, if that's what you are still using. Uh, both Brightspace and Classroom allow students to attach multiple files and file types to a single assignment. So then you would go to that assignment and you would see maybe all five of the files attached and you would be able to flip through them and see what they did. Google Slides is another fantastic way for students to complete um, or excuse me, to turn in all of their work. The nice thing about slides is you can actually have the choice board on slide one, and then the students can very easily uh, add slides where they have inserted images of their work. Um, they can, of course, embed videos from Google Drive directly uh, into that slide. Um, they can also hyperlink to other files if need be. So slides makes that nice little lesson package, if you will, uh, that showcases what they have learned um, for them. 
The last option that I'll mention is Google Forms. And this might be one that you're like, what? I didn't know that I could collect work through Google Forms. But indeed, you can. Uh, there is a file upload question that um, will allow students to upload uh, any kind of file that's been saved in their Google Drive. So again, videos, um, documents, images, audio files, all of those go into the form. It dumps it out into a nice spreadsheet for you as the teacher to go through, and then you can click on and see all of those file types there. So there's really no right or wrong way for you to collect the work. It's really what's going to work best for you. Uh, some assignments, some choice boards might lend themselves better to being a Google slide deck. Some might uh, lend itself better to being an assignment in the LMS. It's really up to you and what's going to work best for you and your kids. Try them all out if you need to. I hope I have piqued your interest in choice boards and learning menus and that you uh, go forth and use these with your students. We have put together lots of resources and examples for you. These will be linked in the slide deck that goes along with this podcast. So look for that slide. Uh, we have links to all of the templates that you saw in this example, as well as some additional resources there for you. And as always, if you have any questions uh, for the Office of Instructional Technology about uh, choice boards, feel free to reach out to your OIT teacher specialist or e-coach. And of course, you can always find us on Twitter, Pinterest, and on YouTube. So thank you and have a fantastic day.